Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Big stories, big opinions, and a few laughs along the way. I'm Mark Dolan. It's time for Headliners, in which we take a first look at tomorrow's papers. Tonight, in the company of Dana Alexander and Leo Kurse. First up, the headlines with Bethany. Thanks, Mark. I am Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Boris Johnson has pledged economic and defensive military help to Ukraine following face-to-face -face talks with President Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev. The Prime Minister said he made his surprise visit to the capital as a show of solidarity for Ukraine. Britain has agreed to send 120 armoured vehicles and new anti-ship missile systems in support of the armed forces there. Boris Johnson says with allies, the UK will continue to intensify sanctions on Russia. Together with friends and partners, we, the UK and others, supply the equipment, the technology, the, the know-how, the intelligence so that Ukraine will never be invaded again. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Zelensky thanked the UK for its support and described Boris Johnson as one of the most principled opponents against Russia's invasion. Speaking at the joint press conference, President Zelensky called for further sanctions on all Russian banks and for an embargo on oil. He also urged other Western countries to do everything to hold Russian soldiers and their commanders accountable for their crimes. I'm grateful to the United Kingdom that continues and intensifies the sanctions and also provides the significant support of Ukraine by reinforcing our defence capacities. Other democratic Western countries should follow the example of the UK. It's time to impose a complete embargo on Russian energy resources and they should increase the amount of weapons being supplied. A senior Ukrainian official says over 4,500 people have been evacuated from cities through humanitarian corridors today. Meanwhile, the governor of the Luhansk region is urging civilians in the eastern region to flee. He warned Russia is preparing a new offensive since shelling has increased in recent days. Ukraine says Russia is planning intensified attacks in the country's east and south. In other news, Pakistan's parliament has ousted Imran Khan as prime minister in an, a vote of no confidence. Speaking before the vote, Khan rejected calls for him to resign and accused the West of a conspiracy to oust him over his recent visit to Vladimir Putin in Moscow. The country's parliament will vote for a new prime minister on Monday. 
The first all-private astronaut team has docked at the International Space Station in an historic mission. This NASA footage shows the SpaceX rocket ship arriving after a 20-hour flight. Passengers include one former NASA astronaut and three paying customers. They're visiting the station 250 miles above Earth for eight days of science and biomedical research. And against the odds at 50 to 1, Noble Yates has won this year's Grand National at Aintree. The seven-year-old horse beat 15 to 2 favourite any second now by two and a quarter lengths. Delta Work was third. The jockey Sam Whaley Cohen described his win as a fairy tale. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to headliners. Many thanks to Bethany Elsie, who returns in an hour's time. I'm Mark Dolan, and this is Headliners, in which we take a first look at Sunday's papers in the company of two top comedians. Tonight, a comic more Canadian than the red maple leaf itself, Dana Alexander, and with her, a comedian more Scottish than the Crankies, Leo Kurs. Great to have you on the show. Lots to talk about. Um, let's start, shall we, with tomorrow's front pages. And we start with the Mail on Sunday. Rishi's on the brink. Astonishing claim that Chancellor broke US immigration law. Friends say he could quit to spare his family. The Mail on Sunday reveals his wife's mystery £4 million loan. We'll discuss whether it's game over for Rishi Sunak very shortly. The Sunday Telegraph, full-scale NATO military force to defend the borders. And Sunak faces questions over blind investment holdings. The Observer next, PM pledges new arms during surprise visit to war-torn Kyiv. And Sunak's hopes of becoming prime minister are over, say top Tories. The Sunday Mirror, police probe soap legend Corrie Simon quizzed by cops after boozy entry. Exclusive actor questioned in van outside Toby Carvery. That's got to go down as a classic headline, hasn't it? Who doesn't love a Toby Carvery? The guy's only human. He probably just went back for more turkey. The Sunday Times now. Sunak's wife escapes number 11 goldfish bowl. Chancellor moves family out after tax Ferrari. And Javid, I was a non-dom for six years, but now pay my full share. Is that Sanjay Javid throwing his cabinet colleague under the bus, I wonder? Under the Rolls Royce, I think, would be more appropriate. <laughs> Sunday Express next. Welcome to Kiev, my friend. Boris vows unwavering support with £100 million in arms for Ukraine. And last but not least, the Daily Star Sunday exclusive. Flop star Martial's red card. Man United cheat dumped by wife. Man United misfit Anthony Martial won't be joined by his wife when he's booted back to Manchester from a loan spell abroad. He cheated on model Melanie when she was pregnant and now she's ditched him. Back of the net, say the Daily Star Sunday. And those are your front page headlines. Uh, Dana and Leo, great to have you with us tonight. Lots to get through. Boris Johnson has flown to Kyiv for a photo op, I mean a diplomatic mission. And Leo, this is all part of the rebuilding of brand Boris, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, this, this war has uh, come at an opportune time for him. He was, you know, just a, a couple of months ago, he was looking like he was going to be scuppered by Partygate and various scandals. But now uh, he's really shining. And to be honest, I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of Britain's role in supporting Ukraine uh, with financial aid, with arms to defend themselves against Russia. And, uh, you know, for, for years, the, the criticism against Boris has been that he's been unserious. And now he's showing that he can be a serious, incredible leader. Uh, and it's dealing a huge humiliation to, to Putin for, for Boris to actually be in Kyiv and be present there and show uh, that he's safe in Ukraine and uh, protected by the Ukrainian uh, services. Um, and yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm, it's great to see Britain stepping up to the mark and showing solid, solidarity when other European countries, such as Germany, are, are starting to backtrack and pr prevaricate yeah. a little. Well, that's right. I mean, Dana, it's obviously a photo opportunity for the Prime Minister. Is it any more than 
that? Um, I think they have to do something. And I think right now Britain's in a position where it needs all of the friends that it uh, can get. Yeah. My question is, how did he find Zelensky? If he can find Zelensky, why can't Putin? That's the question. And it's like, what do you show up with? When you come to Zelensky, what well, do you think? You maybe I mean? there's a WhatsApp group. There's Boris and Zelensky and Macron and a few others. Maybe Joe Biden. Oh, when, like when he remembers to log in, <laughs> if he could remember his passport. His passport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it's a, it is a positive move uh, in what is a horrific situation in Ukraine. Uh, let's move on now. Thousands of ventilators have had to be pulled due to electrical faults. This is not good news for the NHS, is it, Dana? No, it is not good news for the NHS. As all of us know, there have been a few different contracts that have gone belly up during this COVID scandal. So 2,000 ventilators being used in the UK hospitals are at risk of suddenly shutting down due, due to electrical faults that have led to a global safety alert. And as I understand, each of these ventilators are about 15,000 US dollars, and there's about 200 of them that are on the list for recall. Not great, not encouraging when you're fighting for your life. And, and this on, on the back of the pandemic and a very overstretched NHS. Definitely. The, the well, least they can ask for is equipment that works, right? Definitely. Could you imagine being that nurse trying to like, do the mouth to mouth all night until they could get Well, I actually can. I've imagined that on more because than one occasion, these things, which is why I'm not a doctor. These things just suddenly stop working. So you're lying there. You can't breathe because you've got coronavirus or whatever. And suddenly it just stops working like somebody's unplugged it. Yeah. How do they find out it stopped working? That's the question. Yeah, well, I know that the government are now busy looking for that Argos receipt. <laughs> <laughs> and remember which store they brought it from. So uh, it is a concerning story and uh, they must get that uh, recall activated as quickly as possible. How about this? UK holidaymakers face Easter travel chaos. What would Jesus do, Dana? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus would probably stay home. At least that, that's what I would like to do. I've been doing a few different trips. In fact, we had to go to Dubai and I had the worst time just trying to get out of the country. So the fact that 800 plus flights have been canceled, we are in a huge crisis when it comes to um, labor shortages, yeah. especially at a time when there's not exactly the pro-immigrant sentiment is that we might need them after all. Yeah, too right. I, I, and this is, you, you flew to Dubai. Yeah, um, but it was too you, far to swim. <laughs> too far to swim, right? But obviously um, you, you went for, for comedy and, and Leo as a sex, sex tourist, but, but the... the <laughs> I don't, I've I don't seen, know if Dubai would be my first choice as I've, a sex tourist. I've, seen, I've seen the camera roll on your phone. It, <laughs> it makes for uh, X-rated viewing. But, but uh, the, one of the issues is staff absences, Leo. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're being hit by, by COVID, which I, I thought mm. we'd done with. I mean, I, I've got uh, Delta Cron right now and I'm at work. What? Um, <laughs> nah, it's You've just been coughing all afternoon. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I still have some immunity left from Christmas. <laughs> well, let, let's hope so. Although, but, Dana, do you, I mean, does it does it raise the question about whether people are now self isolating because perhaps they got they got a positive test for COVID? I mean, do we get to the point? I think last week one in twelve Brits were said to have COVID. Yeah. Do we get to the point now, as with the common cold, that you still go to work? How many times are you going to come off of work? I mean, I've been in a situation where I've been double booked for stuff and I've had bookers just say, oh, yeah, she has COVID. So it's the ultimate sickie that I think it really is. Pulling. No one argues. That's right. But I mean, do you, you know, is, is it time to revisit that? I mean, we don't want to run around giving people COVID. No, of course. But on the other hand, I mean, if, if planes are not flying, if offices are not fully staffed, if hospital wards haven't got enough nurses or doctors, is it time for a recalibration of our attitude to COVID? I think that it probably is, because I don't think that there is necessarily an end in sight. As you know, Delta Cron is mm. on the horizon and there's a risk of so many new mutations to come up. But I do think, you know, the, the suggestion at be the beginning for a lot of countries like Sweden, for example, was herd immunity. Mm. And it kind of seems like it's going to happen whether or not we want it to. Right, yeah. I mean, what do you think? Are people pulling unnecessary sickies, do you think? Like? Yeah, I mean, it's the perfect excuse. The, the whole of COVID, furlough was the world's biggest sickie. It was a state-mandated sickie. Everybody got to stay inside, play Xbox for like 12 months and get 80% of their salary. No wonder people didn't want it to end. No wonder lockdown's popular in this country. So yeah, and I think this one, I mean, I know we've had a lot of conspiracy theories around COVID, but I think this uh, actual thing, because uh, they're telling people to get to the airport three hours before the flight. I think this is actually, um, is actually caused by, this has been put into motion by mm. Sunglasses Hut and Weatherspoons. So they want people at the airport for three hours uh, browsing the, the Ray-Bans. That's right. I was in a, an airport, I think it was Stansted Airport in, in Essex, 
a few months ago, and I counted the number of ales sold at the Weatherspoons at Stansted Airport. I think it was 16 ales. Oh my God. I think a lot of people- and it was only 7 yeah, a.m. <laughs> it was saying, uh, there's honestly an argument for, for just doing two weeks at the airport. Yeah. You know, at some point I may do that. Perhaps Mrs. Dolan and I will have a falling out and I'll just stick around with the sunglasses and are, she are can, you get, can go this? to Italy. <laughs> well, I, it's, it's become something of a fantasy, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I, I want to be like Tom Hanks in that film, The Terminal. Do you know what I mean? I just like, <laughs> just spend a few days in, in WH Smith. Mm. But there you go, each to their own. Uh, let's move on now to this story. British men are offering rooms to Ukrainian refugees. But only if they're single, this in The Times. A horrible story, Dana, tell me more. Yeah, so single British men offer beds to female refugees. Ukrainian refugees are using Facebook groups to seek safe homes in the UK and are being put at risk of sexual exploitation, a Times investigation reveals. So I think as soon as you see a man offering a bed specifically to a female, I don't see how anyone doesn't see red flag yeah. immediately. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's deeply concerning. And uh, notwithstanding getting refugees out of Ukraine to safety, they need safety wherever they arrive too, don't they, Leo? Well, I think, I think you're both being a bit cynical about this. I mean, uh, one, of these, one of these men uh, said to the woman on the forum, the Ukrainian refugee, said, don't worry, I am not a sex maniac. So that's reassuring, surely. Well, that was my opening it, gambit. And she had to uh, remove the rose petals from the bed. <laughs> That was always my chat-up line. It's great to see single men stepping up to do their bit for the refugee crisis. But I've got to say, it's not just uh, sexual exploitation. I've been on there trying to find a nanny, so... Even know. though he doesn't have a kid. Yeah. I've got one on the way, though. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. You're, you're getting yeah. to that age now. You don't want to exploit someone sexually. You just want them to do the washing up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, can, I can do the sexual exploitation on myself in my own time. And we look forward to hearing more about that in part two of the show. Marine Le Pen is inching closer to Emmanuel Macron in the French election. Um, so what do we think about this, Leo? Uh, the, the press are pretty concerned because they consider this woman to be far right. So uh, is she going to win? And what will happen if she does? Is anyone not considered far right these days? But is she, not, is she not old school, genuine far right? Uh, well, I mean, th this is the thing. I mean, um, a lot of far-right ideas in, in France seem to be seeing a bit of a resurgence. I mean, Macron, who's a centrist uh, for, you know, for months has been seen as a as shoe in for the election. Uh, but this recent poll actually puts uh, Miss Le Pen, uh, who's the heir to the far-right National Front Party, um, above him, 50.5% to 49.5% in, in a second round matchup. Mm. So, I mean, other polls are still putting Macron uh, ahead, but obviously it's pretty close. And after Trump and after Brexit, uh, we can see that, uh, you know, there can be some surprises. Uh, but Macron is seen as sort of out of touch. He's elitist, he's a globalist. And, um, you know, some of the ideas espoused by people who are seen as far right populists, um, you know, maybe people should listen to those concerns, concerns around uh, like, globalization. Like her, like her father's Holocaust denying. Right, and, well, I mean, and, and this is the problem. What, what her parents did? One of the biggest problems is her surname, right? Yeah, fair enough, fair yeah. enough. Uh, and do we know about her policy platform? Yeah, I think she's very anti-immigration. I think she wanted to make sure that any kind of social welfare went, you know, to the French people for first. Um, yeah, that was that's pretty much anti-immigrant sentiments around. But I, mean, I think we're looking at a time, especially now in the West, that our demographics are going to change. And much like, you know, even the Tory party here, party here, they will need black and brown votes if they want to survive. I think that's a fair so point. So they, they got to lighten up. If, if she or, does win, or, yeah, go on. I mean, there's a, there's a case to be made that perhaps not everybody wants unfettered immigration of hundreds of thousands of people a year and some of them from, uh, from ideologies and places that are, you know, ideologically inconsistent with, uh, with Western democracies. I mean, you know, we saw the, the terrible terror attacks in France, you can understand why some people might be concerned about but has, has that horse not already bolted, given the diversity that currently exists in France anyway? I mean, there's, there's Talk an about closing the there's stable an door. To be, to, be, to be said that, yeah, the horse has already bolted, but I mean, 
there's no need to, you know, rush more horses through that door as well. Mm. I mean, do we do we know whether this is just media speculation? Does she have any serious chance of winning? Because no, no the, so, the poll, it, would be, it would be a major political earthquake. The poll uh, said that, you know, she, she's ahead. So one poll has said that she's ahead. And, and also, not since Charles de Gaulle in 1965 has France re-elected a president who's got a majority in the Assembly. So that's, mm. you know, what Macron has, has got. So he would be going against... I mean, this would be, in terms of European politics, this would be a Trump moment moment if she did win, wouldn't it, Dana? Yeah, I guess it would be a Trump moment, but, um, you know, it's too close to call, I think, for the time being. And one of the big things that both of them have to face is that there's a low voter turnout. So yeah. if she does actually sneak ahead, she actually risks having a lot of the people who are left or far left showing up and voting for Macron just to get her out of there. Mm. Fascinating story. Uh, how about this before the break? Rishi Sunak's hopes of becoming prime minister are over, according to Tory insiders. This on the front page of The Observer, Dana. Yeah, so Rishi Sunak's hopes of becoming prime minister are over, says top Tory. Senior party figures think that the furor over the chancellor's US green card and his wife's tax affairs have put an end to his chances. And I think this is a bit wild right now when we're asking British people to be paying more taxes when we find out his wife's, who we all know is richer than the Queen, and she's claimed, uh, what was the status again? Non-dom non -dom status. Non-dom status, and she's not paying tax. And for her to so quickly show up and say, yeah, 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 I'll pay the tax. And I think she might even be paying back some of the tax she's not paid in the past as mm. well. So I wonder what that sum would actually be. But she doesn't have to pay the tax, does she? I wonder she doesn't whether have this to, is, but you the know, fact that she's the, the, she's buckled so quickly to uh, to do so. Do you not volumes. find? Do you not find as a uh, you know a, a extremely accomplished individual that happens to be female that this is a bit sexist that somehow it should matter what her bank balance is. Uh, we're talking about Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, not his wife. Is it a bit sexist? Well, you say that, but I mean, when you have a wife, they're communal assets, are they not, right? So she she knew that she had to switch that up. Nobody had to force her, no, nobody had to force her hand. She did it right away. And no, I think she's doing the right thing. She has her eye on the prize, and that's her husband's success in government. Leo, I'm a married man. You're about to be a married man. I think I we should have that. Oh, congratulations, of course. Thank it was you. a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, you know, we should have a conversation with our spouses about this, this idea of uh, shared shared fortunes. Non-domicile. Non no, but also I didn't, I didn't realise that her money was mine too. But, but I mean, is it, is it game over for Rishi? I, I think oh, completely. It's not I mean, good, this is, is it? This is completely. It's, I mean, he's, he's calling it a smear campaign. It's facts. You can't smear someone with facts. It's ridiculous. And as Dana says, I agree with Dana, uh, you know, marriage is a, is a financial union between two people. So of course her, her financial status matters. And the fact that she's not domiciled in this country, I mean, is it too much to ask that the people who run her your grandest institutions just live here. Well, but that's, and, that's and her not. That's here. her not. I mean, that's, him. A, that's a basic. Yeah, well, she, she's that's an Indian his woman. Wife. She but, was born born in India, and the Indian rules are that you cannot have dual citizenship. So she'd have to relinquish her her homeland, which I think is a lot to ask, just because of her husband's job. I think if you're going to be in politics in the UK, you should really commit to being in the UK. And and Rishi uh, also had a green card while he was chancellor. He was he had a green card for America. He might be using that now. He, was, he might have to reapply yeah, for I it. I wouldn't blame him. Uh, he was he was he had to pay worldwide tax uh, mm. tax on his worldwide earnings in America. So I mean, don't just have one foot in the UK and one foot out. Commit to the UK if you want to be chancellor. Don't we want these high achievers at the top of government? They'll still, honestly, high achiever <laughs> at the top of government. I would love to see a high achiever at the top of government. I don't think we've got any right now. One thing I find very interesting is that this makes him only slightly less unpopular than Boris. <laughs> That's that interesting, say? wasn't it? Yeah, reflect what does that on that. Say? Well, Boris will be happy because he's got one less headache next door mm. to worry about. Uh, he's had a good week. That's very clear. Um, that's at the end of this part of the show. But stay tuned. So much more to come from Dana and from Leo. More hot takes on Sunday's top stories. What does Extinction Rebellion have in store for us next? And which civil servant left top secret documents at the bus stop? I've got them here and it, it makes for explosive reading. See you shortly. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. 
Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets, and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss, and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already, a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children, and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighboring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back to Headliners, a first look at tomorrow's papers. I'm Mark Dolan and with me tonight, Dana Alexander and Leo Kurse. A civil servant left classified documents at a bus stop. This <laughs> from the Sunday Mail. Dana. <laughs> yeah, so top civil servant left 50 secret documents that revealed locations of US and British special forces in Afghanistan. Mm at a bus stop. And uh, top secret documents left at the bus stop have, by hapless civil servant contained locations of British special forces in Kabul and endangered the lives of elite US soldiers. It has emerged. And it was even labeled secret eyes only. <laughs> Are you serious Ridiculous. right now? And Ridiculous. so apparently he left it here and it got soaked in the rain and whoever found it took the time to dry it out and read it. Yeah, well, that was a very sophisticated spy with access to a hairdryer. <laughs> this is a crazy story. And also, what's going on with these printouts? Has this person not heard of PDFs and Thank emails? You. You you're know. wondering, he's probably very old school. He's probably a little messy like Columbo. Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah, first yeah. of all, yeah. what is this silver civil servant doing at a bus stop? He doesn't have a car? Like, what's happening here? You're so right. He, he's probably trapped in a loveless marriage. He drinks whiskey. You know, he's lonely. He's old school. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, a walking school. Story. I, used to, I used to work for the Foreign Office, and part of the process of sending, uh, I can't remember, was it diplomatic telegrams or something? Was, uh, we used those old floppy disks. You know, not, not even the little floppy disks, but the big, actually floppy ones. Oh, wow, ones from flop. the 80s. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, I don't know if that was part of, you know, nobody's going to be able to encrypt or unencrypt or no, read them because nobody's got a, la a laptop from 1982 anymore. Well, look, I'm loving the Colombo imagery, I've got to say, and we'll definitely file this. At a bus stop. We, that yeah, it all right. Just one more thing. <laughs> uh, we'll file that under you had one job. Uh, how about this? The Putin propaganda machine seems to be working well in Russia. Mm. A story in Sunday's Independent, Leo. Yeah, this is rather sad. So uh, Vladimir Putin is keeping the support of the majority of Russians, thanks to increasingly powerful state propaganda. Uh, this is uh, according to the head of an independent TV channel that was shut down by the regime. So they, um, they, they brought, Putin's regime brought through laws that said that any mention of the war in Ukraine uh, would mean that they'd be, um, you'd be cancelled, you'd be liable for uh, 15 years in jail. Uh, so that means that Novaya Gazeta, uh, which is a independent um, uh, newspaper has, has had to remove lots of stories and uh, this TV channel, the Dozd channel, uh, has, has been forced to shut. Um, so Putin was, up until now, Putin was allowing a couple of independent media sources to, to operate just to give his regime, you know, the, the illusion of having a free and independent media. Uh, now, he's gone, now he's gone full on. 
uh, Chairman Mao. Uh, and also, you know, this is happening just as the West is cutting off access to social media and Russia is cutting off access to, to the internet from, from the West. Uh, so previously, you know, people like Alexei Navalny, the Russian oppos opposition leader, would be able to get his message out on YouTube or on, uh, on social networks. And now that's not available as much. I mean, there, there still are ways to, to get it, but it's, it's trickier. So people are just watching the Russian straight, state propaganda, which you, you might be surprised to learn is overwhelmingly uh, biased towards Putin. Yeah, it, this is the issue, is that somehow we need to get through to the people of Russia in order to really move the needle in this well, conflict, don't we? Because well, it's support at home that props up Putin. Well, I'll tell you this. If people didn't support Putin, I can't imagine that they'd say anything. Anti-war protesters are being mm. thrown in jail yeah. left and right. And when it comes to some of his propaganda, I'm sure we all saw that Zelensky with that fake head. Like, who's going to believe I know. that? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And I, what I'm really curious about is how much access Russians have to uh, VPNs, really, because mm. it's not that difficult. And hopefully, like, you know, the VPN companies give Russians some free P VPN subscriptions. Why not? Yeah. It's solve it. Maybe like we should that. sort of just uh, helicopter, I don't know, Samsungs into Moscow, just sort of drop them from the sky. Just drop lots of internet on Russia. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that, would that be the way? Several gallons of internet. The way to do it. Are. Of course, that's the thing. There, there will be an underground resistance that we don't know about. And uh, people and will be, stay that way will, be will be, I guess, work, that, right? you know, communicating in, in that way. Do you think technology is, is on their side in terms of, you know, rebelling against uh, against uh, Putin, but it, without without risking their own lives? Well, it's a double edged sword. I mean, we've seen in the Arab Spring, uh, we've seen how technology can be mobilized to, to spread the word and also mobilize people for rallies and, and protests and things like that. Um, but it also means, um, you know, dictators such as Putin can control uh, technology and control what people have access to. Or when yeah. they had the uh, the uprisings in Egypt, they just shut off Facebook. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah, shocking, they shut off the internet stuff. Uh, completely for a bit. I, I was there. Yeah. The only good aspect of Russian propaganda is if people are reading it or watching it on an iPhone, it'll stop by about 6 p.m. You should draw it in the sky. Yeah. He's but, a liar! It's not a bad shout. Never say never. Let's uh, move on now. Kevin Spacey, the actor, oh, has gosh. asked for the dismissal of his sex abuse suit, according to Sunday's Independent Dana. Oh, another Spacey. Prince, another Prince Andrew. I wonder if he'll just pay it off. So Kevin Spacey has asked a judge to dismiss Anthony Rapp's sex abuse uh, suit. Now, if you guys don't know who Anthony Rapp is, he's the gentleman that played, I think it was Mark, in Rent on Broadway for many, many years. Now, what I find very interesting is that this happened at a party when Anthony was 14 and Kevin Spacey was 26. Who's inviting a 14-year-old to their party when they're 26? And what mom is letting their child go to a party at the age of 14 at a 26-year-old's house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of questions around this. Whatever happened to a curfew, for example? Well, yeah, that's right. You know, some of the anecdotes and allegations around Kevin Spacey are, are you know, that he, he was pretty full-on in his flirtations with you know, grown male adults, actors and, and, and the like. And you sort of think, well, I guess maybe that's showbiz, but a 14 year old is another story. It's no, the and, and when, he, when, he, when they got on him about, you know, questioning, he said, well, I, it was 30 years ago, I can't remember. I, if you were to tell me about that and said that I did it 20 years ago, first of all, it wouldn't happen. I wouldn't have to tell you I didn't remember because there's no way that I would do that. And isn't it annoying that he might have allegedly done these things? Because I really miss his acting. Annoying is a little bit of an understatement. <laughs> Just a bit, yeah. I mean, is there is there any way back for this guy? No. You know, even if he manages to, like, settle this court case and do a Prince Andrew, as you said, could, no. he, could he go back to Hollywood? You don't think no. so? No. No. Definitely not. What do you think, Leo? Is there oh, a way he back? Could, he could definitely House come of Cards, back. season 12? Yeah, definitely, because he's, he's really good at acting, and acting's really difficult. You can tell it's re really difficult because uh, anybody can do it. Um, but yeah, he's, he's been exonerated. He's, he, uh, he's never had a, a, a court case. He's never had a case stick against him. Uh, so like Prince Andrew, Michael Jackson, Jeffrey Epstein, all these people, uh, you know, I, I think he can, he can walk with his... Head held high and, and, and yeah, turf it out. You turf say that, out. but every time you hear those names, the first thing you think is sex pest. Mm. Michael Jackson will never recover from that. I think he's due a comeback. I think. <laughs> <laughs> like a zombie. There's, there's quite a few things that? Michael Jackson will never doom, recover doom, from. Doom, doom, doom. Um, thank goodness for small mercies. Extinction Rebellion have said they will bring London to a halt, according to The Observer, Leo. Oh, God. Uh, I mean, unless they're going to unleash a new strain of coronavirus, I don't think there's any chance of Extinction Rebellion 
uh, bringing anything to a halt. So they say, they say they're going to take part in a mass sit-down protest. Uh, they love sitting down. I mean, they're, they're vegans, so they don't have the energy to stand for long periods of time. Uh, but it's at the heart of London's shopping district, which they think is at Marble Arch. They're completely wrong. It's at Westfield. Go to Westfield and, and sit down. But yeah, several thousand demonstrators with uh, multicoloured flags um, gathered near Marble Arch on Saturday morning and, uh, and they, they moved to Regent Street and Oxford Circus. Uh, they sat down on the road. I don't just what, what Extinction Rebellion. It's like, pick your moment. Not right now. Not when we're facing a fuel and energy crisis, uh, which is doing the work of Extinction Rebellion for them. You know, we've got to cut uh, our fuel consumption because we can't afford it. Uh, but yeah, just wait until, you know, until we're not, you know, Europe and the West aren't at war with Russia. Um, and yeah, also they're such hypocrites. You know for a fact that they didn't all ride horses into this protest. They all, they all got transport, they used energy, they used fossil fuels to get there. They're all wearing clothes, shipped there in trucks and, and made from synthetic fibres, which are made from oil. And also in the UK, we have been exemplary in bringing our carbon emissions down. If they want to protest people who are you know, creating a lot of carbon emissions, go to China. Go to China, knock on Xi Jinping's door and say, Mr Xi Jinping, please stop digging up so much coal and burning it. The problem is, is that if we keep using oil and gas at the rates that we're using them at, there's only about 46 years left of reserves. Mm. And that's a basic fact. There are renewable resources that we can use. Those include solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, ocean, hydrogen, uh, biomass. So there are things that we can do. And I mean, irregardless of whether or not they took the trains and used the energies, we have to reinvest in these other energy sources because we don't have a but, choice. But that, that message is clear, isn't it? And Boris Johnson is committed to wind power and nuclear, which, of course, is hey, pretty clean. Ju so. Probably but just as committed as he was to the lockdown, right? <laughs> but I've been hearing that fossil fuels are about to run out for literally 46 years. It's like, as long as I've been alive, I've been hearing that, you know, the world is about to end, all these doomsayers. Remember when the, the guys with sandwich boards saying the, world, the end of the world is nigh? Used to be the crazy people. In, in the street. They still are. They're just called Extinction Rebellion now. Isn't the issue, notwithstanding a debate around climate change, that their PR is wrong, that the strategy is going to backfire because they're going to annoy the British public rather than take the oh, public with annoy. them? annoy. I mean, lucky you, you get annoyed. If you really want to start a rebellion or you really want to fight the system, I hope they'd be doing more than just annoying But, but No, but British my suggestion is that, that it may backfire and, and actually be counterproductive. Is that What's a concern? What's the alternative? Uh, not democracy, political parties being lobbied to do more for the environment, perhaps? Do you think that's not happening? Well, I guess so. I mean, I think there are competing lobbies, aren't there? Sure. Uh, big I think it's a multifaceted is... approach, you know, and I mm. think the fact that we're talking about it right now on the news <laughs> shows that, hey, they're getting their message out there, aren't they? Yeah. But I'm, I'm just, you know, it's true. I think they all have a carbon footprint and they could all reduce we it all to do. zero by stepping in front of an electric vehicle. So, you know, I think they're complete hypocrites. I don't judge them and what they do with their, how they live their lives. So stop, they should stop forcing their beliefs on other people. It's but like the problem religion. is we got, to, we got to share this energy. We got to share the planet. I mean, somebody has to care about this at some point and action does have to be taken. And it might annoy the British public. And I don't know. I don't think it's enough to backfire. I but, think. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the question also about the timeline that we can all agree that nuclear and renewables is the long-term future for this country and for the world? But it's just that the push to go green in recent years has made European countries, particularly Italy and Germany, dependent on Vladimir Putin's mm. oil and gas. And therefore, in a sense, the eco-agenda has actually backfired geopolitically. Hmm, that's a really interesting point. I never really thought of it that way. Either way, we, have, we know that we have yeah. to reinvest. Yeah, I think you're right. That's, uh, that's the, ultimate, the ultimate issue. Uh, a great debate, which, of course, will continue. The government has outsourced the visa application process, and it hasn't gone to plan, according to the Sunday Times, Dana. Yes, so contractor behind the visa scheme chaos cannot update the applicants. So I think it is 12,500 Ukrainian refugees are looking to settle into Britain, and we've only been able to accommodate about a tenth because oh, uh, they can't basically get through. <laughs> and anyone who lives in this country is not shocked by that. No. Let's be honest, it's kind of like when British people say, oh, we should go out for a coffee. They don't mean it. <laughs> they never mean it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's very true. Uh, your call is important to us. Yeah. Not if you're a refugee. Yeah, well, who would have thought that a government organisation would mess something up? I mean, have we not learned any lessons from every single other government organisation that's ever existed? Look at the DVLA. 
Like, obviously, anything like this is going to be run exactly the same as the DVLA. So I'd be, I'd be amazed if anybody uh, gets, gets their refugee application in before the war ends. But Although, it's, all, yeah, go it's on. also bigger because uh, the company has a sole focus on generating... So the company that has been outsourced to a French... Yes, yeah, so uh, it's not firm. actually the state that messed up. Exactly. So this, the problem is, is that their sole focus is generating income and not actually helping people, right? Yeah, to your right. Uh, a shocker. Well, we're going to uh, take a very short break, but we've saved our best till last. In part three, we'll be discussing prisoners who self-identify as baby. <laughs> you heard me right. And Andrew, uh, Prince Andrew, who uh, thinks he's going to identify as an important prince. Uh, lots of stories to get through. See you shortly. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back to the final part of Headliners, a look at tomorrow's papers tonight in the company of Leo Kurse and Dana Alexander. And in this part of the show, we always go into the weird and wonderful stories from Sunday's papers. And let's have a look at this one. How many police officers does it take to reclaim a Yorkshire Terrier, Leo? <laughs> well, they're very scary dogs and they bark a lot. So, uh, so the police uh, sent nine officers, uh, including armed officers, to seize a Yorkshire Terrier uh, from a woman with a six-year-old boy. So, um, yeah, and she said she feared for her life. Obviously, her, her child was, was traumatised. Apparently, the dog was traumatised as well. But, sure. um, but, you know, it's hard to get the full story from it because it's a dog. Um, but this all boils down to, apparently, this woman um, was given a dog. She says she was given a dog to look after. Uh, and then 11 months later, the person who gave her the dog uh, has said uh, that she stole the dog. And has, because the dog still microchipped and registered to her, um, it ended up with, and the woman refer, refused to give the dog back, it ended up with, with police being sent around to, to break down the front door. I mean, I wish they put this effort into solving crimes such as when my car was broken into, and the police didn't do anything, didn't turn up. Or I should have told them there's a, there a small dog. Um, but yeah, so she's now, uh, the, the dog has been reunited with its original owner, uh, thanks to the arm SWAT team. Uh, going in and, and creating a mini Waco. And uh, so there's the woman who the dog was taken from to give back to the original owner has set up a petition, if anybody wants to go and sign it, um, uh, to get this dog that's called Bobby back. I don't know, just get, get a new dog. Get one that looks the same. They're all, those little dogs are all exactly the right. same. It's you right. I mean, uh, Dana, the allocation of police resources is confusing at best, isn't it? Well, you know, you can always tell when you're in a town that has uh, little, very little action. You know, you go to some towns where the police <laughs> are busy, 
like in Glasgow and Liverpool. Do you know what I mean? And they got better things to do yeah. than be over. So if you're going to be a stolen house. dog, do it in some sort of rural backwater. All, all I see is some bored police officer sitting in his car, sliding over the hood of his car with a sandwich in his <laughs> yes. hand. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 Coming to save the day. Yeah, I think that's why they did it. They saw it was going to be an easy job. So everybody wanted to turn up. You know, there's a chance of getting a, a cup of tea and a donut. You know, I bet, I bet if they'd said, you know, there's a six foot eight guy with a bread knife, uh, about, you know, three and a half people would have turned up. I'm sure it will be the main storyline of Tom Cruise's next Mission Impossible, won't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Especially that bit with the uh, sandwich in his hand. Uh, moving on. What do you do if a prisoner identifies as a baby? Give them a dummy, according to the star on Sunday, Dana. This is just too much. So now a murderer, this is a, a trans uh, individual, who now identifies as a child, wears nappies and eats baby food in a UK jail. Sophie Eastwood, dubbed as Hannibal Lecter Jr., has been treated like a baby and has already been given a dummy by the guards inside Scotland's Polymount prison. Well, I have a personal anecdote because I made, <laughs> <laughs> not about the dummy or nappies or babies, but I made a documentary about a guy called Dennis Avner, mm -hmm. and he was known as the cat man, and he identified as a feline, as a cat, and he had plastic surgery to give himself fangs, and he had silicon in his cheeks to make himself look very cat-like, he had tattoos, the whole thing. And at first, you know, when we set up the story, I just thought this is ridiculous and he's an attention seeker or he just wants to be in showbiz. I met this guy and it was a real thing. He's like, look, I, I have, he, he, uh, he had a Native American DNA and for him, cats were very totemic mm -hmm. and he just felt like a cat. And after two weeks with this guy, I'm like, I got it. You're a cat. That's how you identify. So actually, if this guy wants to identify as a baby, who are we to say he can't? Oh, I can ah. see it because I'm a taxpayer and he's in prison, paid for with my taxes. It's a prison, <laughs> not a 300 pound an hour fetish dungeon, dungeon. Like, do it on your own money. And why are we indulging this guy? He's a, he's a, he's a criminal. But it raises a, quite, a, quite an important um, statistic. So apparently one in 50 of uh, male prisoners identifies as, uh, as a woman. Um, so the one in 50 are transgender. That's uh, a big increase on, on the general population, which is just one in 400. So why are so many of them doing it? Is, is it, is it pragmatic? Is it what? Is it pragmatic? Yeah, is it, is it to get access to, to spaces? Is it to get special treatment? Yeah. Uh, I mean, do, do you buy? Is there well, any, no, is there any possibility that this guy no. just feels like he's a baby? No. And <laughs> but I'll, isn't that, I'll, isn't I'll, isn't that, go on, tell me I'll why. I'll tell you why. Go on. <laughs> for one, they're serving a life sentence for murdering their cellmate with a, sho with a shoelace. So do babies do that? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, uh, and, temperamental ones do. Okay, yeah. perhaps. But if they haven't if, had their nap. If you're going to yeah. indulge a prisoner as a baby I'm so, with a nappy. Please tell me who's changing that nappy. Please tell me. <laughs> Good point, yeah. Get, uh, get Big Jim to do it. Uh, shocking story, I think you'll agree. Um, how about this? Let's move on. A feel-good story at last. A banker is going to prison, Leo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a former Goldman Sachs banker has been convicted by an American jury of conspiring to violate an anti-corruption law in connection with a $4.5 billion embezzlement of Malaysia's state investment fund. This is a huge, this is a huge scandal. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the biggest in the world. One MDB, it was, uh, it was it was called that was the um, the, the wealth the sovereign wealth fund um, so four and a half billion dollars so so this guy uh, apparently well, he faces up to thirty years in prison he's called Roger Ng uh, he's Goldman's former top investment banker from Malaysia and he uh, he I believe he took. Uh, funds. Um, uh, he enabled, you know, the, the the grafting of these funds from this investment fund. Yeah. Well, uh, we're not going to miss this guy on the streets, are we? Well, I think first of all, he, ra he raised six point five billion and took four point five. I think the moral of the story <laughs> is steal less. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry, who has four point five billion to spend on artwork and investing in the Wolf of Wall Street movie, which I think is a full circle moment. Yeah, it is nearly as bad as Mrs. Sunak, isn't it? Mm. Well, speaking of uh, figures in the dock, Prince Andrew still has a lot to give, according to the Mail's sources. Uh, what do we think about this, Dana? Is there, way, is there a way back for Prince Andrew? No, there is never a way back. Disgrace Kevin Spacey, still... Prince Andrew. No. I mean, maybe they you could know, do a reality you know show. Back? I think he should go on to children's television. 
That's right. what I think he should do. Who, Andrew? Pull a Savile. You know what I'm saying? Oh, Anyways, blimey. <laughs> Andrew still has a lot to give. Disgraced Duke still wants to return to the public life and cis friends who can be re rehabilitated despite the 12 million rape case payout that he made to Virginia Roberts. No. What is he thinking? And then he went into this long Instagram post about his his life in the Falkland Wars and, you know, the time when he, st when he lost all ability to sweat. Give me a break. However, what about forgiveness? Forgiveness? What about jail? Well, no criminal case was ever brought against him. And he made a generous dona donation of $12 the million. The Queen dollars. made a generous donation, and you and I made a generous donation. Yes, we did. <laughs> Let's be honest about that. Well, he made too many donations, which is why he got in trouble in the first place. Oh. But here's the thing, Leo Kurs. Uh, yeah. This is coming from his people, mm -hmm. friends of the prince, uh, but they're, they're just barking up the wrong tree, aren't they? It's not going to happen. There are still some friends of the prince. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they obviously want him to be rehabilitated. But no, I mean, to be honest, he was a terrible prince. Even before he was outed as uh, some sort of creepy... Um, uh, Quas Quasi-pedophile. Quas I mean, yeah. Although, of course, he denies no, any allegations. Yeah, no allegations ever ever landed, and he just he paid that $12 million. Doesn't he have, like, for, 35 for, teddy bears on his bed or some nonsense that have to be set in a certain way? Another like allegation that cannot be, cannot, <laughs> cannot be stood up. But, I love these conspiracy theories that go around. Yeah. So, I mean, look, the guy, look the, the, guy, the guy has been found guilty of nothing. He denies all allegations strenuously. What is he going to do with the rest of his life? Well, I mean, it's, it's not as if he's going to have to get a job stacking shelves at Knights and Morrison's. I mean, he is still uh, royalty. He's still got, you know, the, the Queen probably doesn't have too many years left. Uh, so he's going to inherit a wedge from that. So he can do what he wants. He can kick up his heels, enjoy uh, living in power. What's he going to do? Basically just, you know, ride his horse and... Make friends with another Epstein, maybe. Yeah, maybe. That's now it. That get on, get on Facebook. Find now he knows new, it only costs $12 million. Find pounds. some new, new dodgy friends. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. How about this? The next story is about something quite close to my heart. I am a cheapskate after all. Leo, I'm very excited about this shop. I think it's uh, it's actually very anti-Scottish and uh, prejudiced that you gave this story to a Scotsman okay, because it's about Britain's cheapest shop, which I can't wait to visit. You've heard of pound shops. This is a 20 pence shop. And not, not in the 60s when 20 pence was a lot of money. This is right now, right here. Uh, this is in, in Yorkshire, in West Yorkshire. Uh, founder Steve Nelson launched the 20p shop in Otley uh, around five years ago. And it's been a huge success because it's incredibly cheap. And uh, so he gets all kinds of random stuff into the shop um, and uh, one lucky customer bought jewellery in the shop for just 20 pence because it's a 20 pence shop had it valued at 120 pounds what an amazing that's that's better she's than buying bitcoin now. she's rich yeah. now it's better than buying bitcoin i might buy a bracelet for mrs dolan from this 20p shop and i'll just tell her don't wear it for prolonged periods because you might get a rash yeah. i just feel that little has been ripping me off all these years <laughs> yeah correct it's a little is like harrods compared to this place yeah well you can you can get everything in here they have clothing they have food uh, like pot noodle a lot of the food is past its sell by date but you can still eat it if you're crazy. And, uh, and furniture as well, 20 pence furniture. Somebody got a hall carpet. Um, I mean, he describes it as a hall carpet. It was, it was a roll of carpet. Well, is it like a charity shop? Is it a secondhand gear or what is it? Uh, so no, it's, it's, uh, as far as I know, it's, it's new. I it's new, uh, so it might be slightly expired, slightly tampered with, but, uh, but it's 20 pence. I mean. I think it's a great idea and very yes. bad news for the share price of Poundland, Dana. Yeah. I guess, but I don't know how you pay rent with things that are 20p. That doesn't make any sense. Well, is it, it's volume. It's a volume model, I guess. That's true. And they have customers that are coming in there two and three times a day. I'm sorry, but I don't, I'm not buying furniture from a place that sells pot noodle. I'm too really? suspicious. Maybe if it was a 50p shop. God, you I love these cheap shops. I wish I like brake fluid there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it incredible. I mean, I love Primark, for example. I just mm. think the bargains are great. Yes. The reason why it's so cheap is the customers have to tidy up before they start shopping. <laughs> and how much is the bag going to be? I've bought bags. For oh, the bag's feet. a killer. <laughs> yeah, the bag. That's where the profit is. There you go. Moving on, uh, we've got two more stories and uh, let's see if we can get them in because uh, they're both corkers. Westminster Council have been reviewing statues, Dana. Ooh, statues, the contentious issue of statues. We saw so many different statues come down, especially Edward Colston, as I'm sure a lot of people are familiar Absolutely. with in Bristol. So Winston Churchill has apparent racist views according to Westminster Statue Review. The wartime leader was on a list of more than 50 monuments which official, officials deemed at risk in light of the Black Lives Matter protests. Mm. I mean, here's the thing, clearly, 
there is there is some suggestion that Winston Churchill said and thought some some pretty horrific things, but he defeated Hitler. Does that not trump everything else? Well, I mean. Let's see if they can even get them to change the, pla the placard to say something about Bengal. I mean, that was one of the issues with Colston, mm. is they wouldn't even tell the story. And I think something that was very interesting, um, when all of this went down in Bengal, there was somebody who sat there and wrote a long book and documented exactly how this famine went down. And the Brits came in and they burnt that book. So mm. it's another case of revisionist history. And I think it's up to the people whether or not... Copies. He wrote many, several. Anyways, but it's up to the British public whether or not they want it to come down, right? Yeah. Take, how do you feel about Saddam coming down? How do you feel about the statu mm. statues of Hitler coming down? I'm not comparing him to them necessarily, but you know, three million Bengals starving is nothing to forget about. Important conversation to have. Uh, Leo, what do you think about this? Well, I think, I mean, he may have had some some views that were slightly dodgy by, uh, by, the, by the standards of a university campus in 2022. But it was the old days. And everybody had slightly dodgy views in the old days because it was the old days. It was before we had, you know, all this. Uh, but it was before the civil rights. The colonial before era. Rights. Mm. It was, yeah, colonial, colonial era. So I'd be surprised if he, if he did have the exact same uh, correct woke opinions as a gender studies graduate who lives in Brighton in 2022. And I think, you know, really, we should look to Ukraine, which has really shown us how, how Western civilization should, should be lived. They're protecting their statues. If you look at Kyiv and other cities in Ukraine, they're putting sandbags around the statues to protect them from any shrapnel. That's what we should be doing instead of tearing our statues down and destroying our history. Last but not least, in the Sunday Express, vegetable oil in Waitrose. Tell me more. More supermarket news. Uh, so this is the cost of living crisis. Um, so major supermarket chains, including Waitrose and Morrison's, are rationing cooking oil products, uh, allowing customers to only buy two bottles each. So this includes sunflower oil, olive oil, rapeseed oil, and other products. Uh, but I've actually converted my chip fryer to run on old diesel. So that's going to I wonder what the smell was. <laughs> but I think, uh, I think this, is, this is time for air fryers to shine. We, you don't need oil. To have fry you ever fryer. used an air fryer? I've never used I, one, I but I'm going to get air fryer, one. Yeah. You, you don't own one. I do. Are they good? So they, Forty they pounds want? at uh, Morrison's. I quite like mine. I mean, the problem that I have with my air fryer is that there's just not enough volume, oh, right? A lot of them, are, the units are about this big at most. So if you have a family, if you want to serve everyone hot food at the same time, you're probably better off with. So how oven. does an air, dry, air air fryer work? So it's convection. Basically, so hot air blows through it. So what you would do is you take something like a very low calorie, whatever a low calorie oil spray is, yeah. on whatever you want from chicken fingers to chicken wings to chips. Chips, yeah. And wow. a lot of it's really good for a lot of frozen stuff, and it's really good for reheating. Oh, man. I find like if I just want to grab a piece of pizza from the night before, I'll throw it in. And God, I think I it want might your actually. Life. And I think it might actually um, save on ener energy. That'd be something to look into. Yeah, that's that's great. A nice little advert there for a for a uh, air fryer. Maybe well, from the twenty p shop. Money and not going uh, don't buy one for the twenty p shop because it'll probably burn the house down, <laughs> won't it? Uh, the, these uh, these food issues are going to continue for as long as the war rages, Leo. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the reason uh, sunflower oil is spiking in prices is because uh, Ukraine uh, grows sunflower seeds. So now with you know the the wheat and uh, and sunflowers of Ukraine not being grown and not being exported. And also Russia as well, you know, grows a lot of foodstuffs. So we're going to see uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, food products go up in price in the UK. But also we're going to see a lot of problems with uh, starvation and uh, lack of access to food in uh, in third world countries. Yeah, I mean, yes, and then we just have to build a statue for whoever creates this problem. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, <laughs> that's bound to happen, isn't it? Uh, it's been a very interesting conversation. I want to thank uh, my brilliant guests tonight on Headliners, the brilliant Dana Alexander, and of course the one and only. Lee Leo Kurs. Headliners is back tomorrow with more front page stories at 11 o'clock. So do join us then. Um, and we've also got a very busy show tomorrow for Mark Dolan tonight, which starts at nine tomorrow. Um, we've got some really big debating issues. We're going to look at whether we should bring back hanging for the worst crimes. Um, and also we've got my all star panel. We look forward to that. So thanks for your company. It's been a busy three hours. I'll see you tomorrow at nine. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. 
And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will